Hi, I'm Tori Hartman, and I'm going to read for you today my story, The Fountain Tuner, which appeared in the first volume of the Fault Zone series that the California Writers Club published. In this volume, called Words from the Edge, um, there's some great stories, and I hope that you find it in the library or you find it on Amazon. We watched the fountain water buckle upward and flow with seeming abandon down a three-foot slope, populated with rocks as smooth as eagle's eggs, some as large as Idaho potatoes. Norris Gardner, on all fours, didn't let his knees touch the stone as he glided like a skeeter bug around and around the fountain. Occasionally, after moving a rock or two, he sat back on his haunches, cocked an ear, and listened intently. What on earth is he doing? I whispered, stifling a laugh, hoping he couldn't hear me over the gush of the water. Tuning the fountain, Nora replied matter-of-factly, as though I should know these things, and if I didn't, where had I been? I, of course, looked at Nora as though she again, like the time she nearly starved to death on the nuts and water diet, had gone plum loco. I wondered if some investigative journalist would soon reveal that the tuner was tone deaf. The ruse of the fountain tuning exposed as an urban twist on the story of the emperor's new clothes. Tuning a fountain is very important, Nora said, with the authority of Deepak Chopra. My mother and I have been fighting. My friend Valerie suggested Haruku-san because he can restore a fountain's balance, its rhythm in the universe. Her hands traced a halo in the air above her head. A correctly tuned fountain can bring inner peace as well as good health. Speechless, I nodded as though I knew this already. I can't believe, Nora said, that Haruki-san's first visit was only two months ago. The difference in my life. She shook her head as though there were no words to describe her feelings. Now, Mother and I sit around the fountain every evening like it's a campfire. We haven't fought since. And Valerie? She's back with Michael. This talk about balance, tuning a bunch of rocks and water like tightening a violin string to find middle C made me struggle to squelch the bubble of laughter rising in my throat. Deep in my heart, however, I envied Nora for being able to get along with her mother. I certainly couldn't get along with Edwina. As though age gave her a bully pulpit, she relished telling everyone exactly what she thought. No holds barred. She wasn't beyond commenting to strangers that they were wearing an unflattering print or a hideous hairstyle. Frankly, I dreaded having Edwina over and feared she would make a comment about my husband or about the way I kept my house. If I really thought tuning my fountain, a medium-sized fake rock affair, abandoned on my back deck would help smooth the vicissitudes of life. You bet your sweet ass Badistra, I'd do it. When I returned home to my low ceiling condo, my husband of four years passed me in the hall. He gave me that 900 yard stare and a pang of longing twinge through my center. In my head, I could hear Nora's mother croak Listen, kiddo, you'd better take action. The dew in this marriage is off the lily. Perhaps my husband, husband and I should part or live separately for a while or go to some weekend sexual tantra thing at a vegetarian spa. Secretly, I was wishing the Dalai Lama would come to dinner and gently tell me that love would conquer all that it was possible to rekindle the flame of desire after it's been extinguished by the day-to-day -day distaff of life. But I didn't know the Dalai Lama, let alone know how to cook for him. Maybe he never eats. 
They say you can tell what frame of mind you're in by your daydreams, and I must admit, mine had sunk to new lows. I'd been wondering what I would do if I were suddenly single. Would I dare to register at one of those internet dating services or put a blind ad in the paper? S-W-F seeks S-W-M. I don't know any more urban alphabet than that. I'd need to get a hold of a cheat sheet. I can't stand it when I don't know something. I suppose that's why I collect maps. Just in case I get stuck in Riotea, I'd be able to find the shoals. That's when Mr. Haruki's startling talent came to mind. Walking out to our deck, I eyed the moribund fountain we'd purchased the weekend we moved into this apartment. I suppose we imagined ourselves sitting out on the deck, listening to the tinkle of falling water. Within months, it filled up with bright green algae, pumping, draining, scrubbing, yuck. I also hated the pigeons that congregated around it, drinking the water, perching, wooing females. S-G-P, single gray pigeon, seeks dot, dot, dot. And covering the deck with white splotches, not far Not fair, excuse me, when the birds are having more fun than the humans. Willfully, I'd let the water dry up and turn my back on the whole outlandish thing, a fountain on the back deck. What a silly, romantic idea. Mr. Haruki didn't come up to my shoulder, which made me feel too tall, as well as too fat. He ignored the pleasantries. I showed him the defunct fountain. Ah, he said, ah, ah, indeed. He returned to his aging truck, an older model that looked ready to vanish in a cloud of gray powdery dust and came back with buckets and chemicals. Rocks removed, he scrubbed the artfully irregular fountain tub with the enthusiasm of the newly saved. I shrunk back into my office embarrassed that the cruddy thing was proof of my slothful ways, the herald of my incompetence. Missy? He presently called in the hallway. Yes, I said, ready to apologize for the dried algae as well as the clogged pump. I wanted to pay him something right then and there, make amends for my neglectful ways. You want inside or out? Taken aback, My hand spontaneously drifted to my chest. I didn't know I had a choice. Yes, fountain look good here, he said, gesturing as though he knew how to give a 747 directions to the gate. Or here, he showed me another vacant area area in our sparsely furnished living room and made that airplane parking gesture again. Derek and I preferred the simple life simple furniture, folding furniture, some from the days where we were never in an apartment for over a year. Everything could be moved by either of us in a couple of crosstown trips. Putting a water feature inside the apartment was a radical departure from our normally Spartan ways. Haruki-san waited. Patience remained one of his virtues. Won't it leak? Oh, no, no, liner here, fountain on top, gives best sound this way. Outside, pigeons. Yes, the pigeons. Liner, $80. More rocks, $50. Fountain tuning, priceless. This tuning visit alone was $150. I feared tearing, telling Derek of my folly, dreaded seeing the sarcastic curl of his lip when he found... I had the fountain tuned. I thought of the way he'd been scolding me lately for not responding quickly enough to his emails. I wondered when we had lost the ability to talk to each other without pushing send. He might now use my inability to return his emails as an excuse to bury himself in the latest Sudoku puzzle. 
He completed them with vengeance, using math like a weapon, his pencil a mighty sword. I decided not to tell him about this expensive fountain frivolity. The cost would be my secret. If it worked, it would be cheaper than a therapist. Mr. Haruki still waited. His expression revealed no judgment. Nora's mother said that marriage is until death do you part or you begin clenching your teeth so hard your gums bleed. My teeth were certainly clenched. My headache proof of that. Gum bleeds couldn't be far behind. I wondered if Haruki-san also gave marital advice. Okay, I said, let's try inside. I bravely pointed to the first place Mr. Haruki had indicated. He bowed. Mirroring his gesture, I found myself bobbing back. Then in relief, first, sorry for that little uh, thing. The tape didn't hold. Mm. Put a cup of coffee on it. Always works. He bowed, mirroring this gesture, I found myself bobbing back, then inwardly cursed for being so susceptible to suggestion. Maybe the fountain tuning would work because I wanted it to work. Maybe it wouldn't work, but since I thought it would work, it should work, it would work. So who could declare it bunk if it worked? Derek. That's who. Two hours later, the fountain gurgled and burbled, rushing and rambling down the incline. Magically, every muscle in my face relaxed. <sighs> Job done. Mr. Haruki bowed his way out like a samurai tuner. At last alone, I poured myself a glass of wine and sat down next to the bubbling urban stream. Nora was right. It was lovely. I curled up and closed my eyes, let the sound of water tumbling over the rocks loosen the knot in my center, and drifted off to sleep into what I can only describe as a waking slumber. I could feel the vibration on the floor as Derek walked toward me like a computer taking too long to boot. He remained silent for a long time. What's this? He finally said. Rolling over, I glanced up at him and grinned. It's supposed to be good for the soul, I said. The carpet's going to rot, he said. There's a liner. The humidity will cause mold. He squinted down at me, even upside down. He was still handsome. Mold can cause cancer, he growled. But you'll die happy, I said, laughing as lightly as the rippling brook at my feet. He stomped away. I wondered if he would now email me with an ultimatum. Either the fountain goes or I go. The babble of my brook washed my mind. I snuggled against the bevy of silk pillows on the floor and wondered how long it would take for the water to work its magic. The end. I hope you enjoyed that. My name is Tori Hartman. I've also written a novel. You can obtain it maybe in the library, I don't know, or from Amazon. It's called First Friday, How Virginity Almost Killed Me. It's an Irish comedy and mystery. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Bye.